today in this hour, we're going to be talking about those Zoom calls. You may have been invited not once, not twice, but multiple times uh, to the various Zoom calls that have been organized to support the Harrison Walls campaign. Some of these calls uh, literally breaking the Internet. The, a call involving white women had over 100,000 people uh, raised over $8 million. And then there's the call that happened on the night that Kamala Harris, July 21st, that is, threw her hat into the ring and said, I'm ready. I want to be your 47th president. Uh, that night, uh, Joe Taka Edie, CEO and founder of Full Circle Strategies and uh, organizer of Win with Black Women, she convened 40,000 African-American women, and I'm sure some allies, on a call where they raised uh, over a million dollars and started something which has become a regular weekly call with elected officials, community leaders, and others uh, who are organizing around the Harrison Walls campaign. Well, this uh, phenomenon, these Zoom calls, we've seen them with South Asian women, Latinas, Native women, white men, uh, black queer men, you know, different groups, different ethnic groups and different identity groups are using these calls as a way to uh, you know, bring people together as well as raise substantial money for the campaign. Uh, Karitha Mitchell, she's a professor at Boston University, was intrigued by this so much so that she wrote a really insightful article for Times Magazine. So in this hour, I'm going to be talking to Professor Mitchell and Joteka about what we are witnessing, these Zoom calls. Why are they so effective? How do you maintain the momentum of some of these earlier calls all the way uh, to the election in November? And what can we expect going forward in terms of elections? Is this going to be the, no, the new way that we organize voters and even the new way that we raise millions of dollars for candidates? And might this work for some of these down ballot races, not just uh, the presidential race. I got lots of questions for our guests in this hour, so make sure you stick around. Happy to have both of you here. Welcome, Dr. Mitchell, and, and welcome, Joteka. Uh, first, I want to start with you, Joteka. A lot of folks think that in a couple of hours you were able to organize 40,000 women, but talk to us about the organizing you have been doing, uh, doing long before uh, we got the news that Joe Biden was stepping down and Kamala Harris was going to be uh, running for president. Well, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, such uh, a deep appreciation for your work and advocacy and, and always glad to be here on this amazing show. Uh, you know, the, the question that you ask about the work of organizing, I think it, it, it predates me. Um, and, and it's been the work of Black women for so long in the political arena, but just really across the country. And so Black women, we have been organizing for years. We have um, you know, long been doing this work. Um, I don't think at the recognition levels that we are receiving now that we are receiving. Um, but when with Black women particularly had been around for four years and we meet on most Sunday nights. And so the meeting on July 21st was a regularly scheduled when with Black women Sunday night call. But of course, once <laughs> we got the news, we knew that we needed to change uh, the... Uh, we needed to change the agenda. We needed to speak to the times and the moment. And we knew that there were two things. Uh, well, three things. Uh, one, we wanted to just be in a moment of gratitude to President Biden, because what President Biden has done, he has ushered in history. Uh, he is a president that I believe has has saw and has centered and has lifted up the leadership and brilliance of black women throughout his administration, throughout his career, quite frankly. Um, and he did that. Uh, second, we knew that we wanted to galvanize behind Vice President Kamala Harris and send a very clear message that for anyone who thought that we were going to try to have any other conversation outside of Vice President Kamala Harris as a presumptive nominee, uh, for anyone who thought they were going to jump or skip over her and that they were going to become the nominee and that somehow that she was going to go away, that they were going to have to jump over a giant wall of Black women and our allies to do so. And third, that we needed to start the work of organizing, which is what we're doing now. Uh, we meet on Sunday nights, but we we are organizing. There are 40, over 44 state volunteer groups. Uh, we knew that we needed to raise money. And so that work led by the amazing Star Jones, uh, who has been a part of Women with Black Women since its inception, we dropped that link at 11.30 p.m. 
By 1 a.m., we had raised the $1.6 million. We've raised over $2.5 million. And as you said at the top of the show, we have we have inspired so many others to do the same. And, and, and they have had calls and there have literally been hundreds of thousands of people. We're tracking over 130 of these calls, ranging from the Swifties for Kamala, cooking, the comics, the dogs and the cats, the cat lady, <laughs> the adventurers, the dreadheads, the white dudes, the white women, the black men uh, for Kamala and have raised um, now well over $20 million. And wow. it just shows the power of just getting out there and doing something, um, knowing our power as individuals, not waiting for someone to appoint us to do something, but just stepping out there and doing it. And Black women have been doing that for a very long time. Um, and 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 so I think a lot of people see the call on the 21st. They think, oh, we just did that in three hours. No, we had laid a foundation for four years where we had been doing that work. Now, certainly it was a special moment and we had 44,000 on Zoom. And another 50,000 that we can count that were in other spaces, because as uh, unlike the other Zoom calls that took place after ours, our Zoom opened up in real time. Like we were mm. expecting a thousand people and we have 44,000 on Zoom. We had 30,000 in Clubhouse, you know, 20,000 on conference call lines and other Zoom Zooms and other places. And so it's just been a testament of 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 the work um and and i am just honored to see black women's leadership and black women's um uh our work um honored and centered in this moment let me ask you this to take uh, four years that thank you for laying that foundation because like i said a lot of people think oh my god in three hours as you said they put this call together which we now know is close to a hundred thousand people what would a typical Sunday night call have been like had this news even and I want to go back even before Joe Biden announced that he was running for president. So, you know, let's say the first year of his presidency and, and Kamala Harris's vice presidency. What were your typical Sunday night calls like? Oh, they ranged anywhere up to a thousand people because we would meet in Zoom meet. Uh, and so I spent years in Silicon Valley as a as a as an executive there. So I know a lot about Zooms and, and technology. And so Zoom technology allows in the meeting format for you to have up to a thousand participants in mm -hmm. webinar you can have at one point it was up to a hundred thousand it was uh moved up to more than that and as a result of our call zoom has now recently announced the ability to have a million and so wow. like that's also the business impact that our calls have been making it's just really great to see that happen um, but it would be anywhere up to a thousand people, and they always feel like I, I always call. Well, what it would you be talking about? Because there was no race for presidency the first year that Biden and Harris were in office. So, what would be the typical topic, you know, in that first year of their presidency? So, the first year that we started, it actually was during the 2020 presidential campaign. So, we came together because we were collectively concerned and outraged as it related to who was going to be uh, the narrative around who was going to be the vice president of the United States. Every black woman who had been named in that process, if you probably could remember, there were just racist, sexist attacks. They were too ambitious. Uh, they were trying to pit the black women against each other. And we were very clear that not on our watch, not at, not in this moment, would we as black women from across the country be concerned. And this was also during the pandemic, which because we were in the pandemic, probably that first meeting would have likely looked like a DC based meeting with DC operatives. But mm -hmm. because we were in the pandemic and um, because of the nature of that meeting, I, I'll never forget that night I, I was watching uh, the news and I watched a video by Bishop Leah Daughtry. And then I was like, I agree with her. I called my friend Mignon Moore. Um, and, and, and I said, Mignon, what are you all going to do? Meaning the colored girls, the famed political, um, colored girls. And, and she was like, well, what are you going to do? Meaning what is your generation going to do? Um, uh, right. what are the Jotaka Edies, the, the Angela Rise, the Tamika Mallory's, the Brittany Patton, the Cummingham's, the Reverend Siobhan, Arline Bradley's, what are y'all going to do? And so I, I, I took me like 20 minutes to gather myself and say, you know, she's right. And I sent an email to 65 friends and, and I have had the privilege and blessing um, 
of working across various fields. So whether I've been in Silicon Valley in tech or my time at the NAACP or in politics or entertainment, and it was a wide uh, array. And that night, 90 of us got on a call around that collective concern. We wrote an open letter. Two days later, there were more than 2,500 and up to 4,500 women that signed that open letter. And then we decided to keep moving. And so a typical Sunday night, it was in joy and love. We had a good time. We opened in the spirit. We closed in the spirit. We have something called after hours where just black women are just on a Zoom call, just laughing and talking, everything from a strategy session to a therapy session to a dating session. Um, right. <laughs> and we have had some of the most um, profound Black women um, that have been a part of Women with Black Women. And we all sort of take turns going on the stage uh, and we champion those issues, whether it's the WNBA Players Association and the work following their leadership to help bring Black women's voice um, to the forefront around bringing Brittany Griner home, or whether it's Black women uh, following uh, the leadership of executives um, in the entertainment industry to buy out 100 theaters for The Little Mermaid to show that we do need to have representation in Hollywood, or whether or not it's working to ensure that countless um, Black women are confirmed in the Biden-Harris administration, whether that's Dr. Lisa Cook, who is now uh, the first Black woman to right. be governor on the Federal Reserve Board, or whether or not that is Ketanji Brown-Jackson, Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson, who right. is the first Black woman on the U.S. Supreme Court, and so much in between. When with Black women, I like to call a collective love letter to Black women from Black women. Yeah, so Dr. Uh, Mitchell, jump in here. You wrote this article. Obviously, you witnessed what uh, Jateka has just laid out so eloquently. Uh, what is moving you or what moved you about what you witnessed in this moment about these Zoom calls and the way that people have come together to organize? Yes, thank you so much, first of all, for having me. And what an absolute honor to share the space with not only you, Ariva Martin, but also Joteka Edie. Um, you're exactly right, um, Ariva. I was absolutely blown away. So when Joteka created that first Zoom, I was getting text messages about getting on. And I was actually at home in Houston visiting my family. And so I wasn't able to get on that meeting, but I saw all of the text talking about, okay, now we're gonna open to this size and this size and this size. So I knew um, how much it was exploding in real time. And I have to say, first of all, that especially now hearing everything that Joteka Ida had to say, I'm struck by the fact that she began by saying, please remember that this kind of activism began before me, right? My work has focused on Black women in the 1890s through the 1930s. And part of what had me so excited about what I witnessed um, and what I've been witnessing is that Joteka Edie and all of those sisters are very much in the tradition of Black club women of the 1890s through the 1930s. And so part of what has been so powerful for me to witness this is to see how other groups are recognizing the leadership of Black women. Because part of what is striking, even in recent history, is that Black women have always made the call. They have always led the way. But very often, as an example from the 2020 election and 2016 as well, white women who were getting in the fray actually were doing it in hiding. Mm. Watch Jotika, Jotika Edie and the others do it in public and then watch white women and the other groups do it in public is what's powerful and made me pitch that piece for Time Magazine. So the bottom line for me is what we're witnessing is people who are in privileged uh, identity categories like white women and white men, they are recognizing that their specific identity is valuable because we are in an unjust society and they can use their specific identity to be in coalition with black women and others. And that is what is so exciting about watching people claim their own identity and then linking their own identity to others. Well, you know what was so interesting to me, uh, Dr. Mitchell, about uh, your article was you talked about identity politics and there being a period in this country where that would have been, or identity politics, you know, were looked at negatively. It would have That's been negative word. for you to lean into a black women or 
Black queer men or Latina women to lean into your identity and organize around that identity. And even when you think of this divided world that we live in, right, this divided nation, all the attacks on DEI, all the lawsuits by white people saying that sitting in a DEI class on in the workplace is a form of discrimination or they feel discriminated against, you know, when they have to hear about white supremacy, white privilege, you know, white hierarchy. Uh, the fact that there are white people, as, as evidenced by that white women's uh, call, and I had uh, the organizers of that call on a couple of weeks ago, uh, and there are white men, you know, white dudes, I think they called it for yep. Harris, uh, who aren't afraid, even in this moment, even when you yes. juxtapose the attacks on DEI and the, the cries of white people saying they're being discriminated against, help us understand these two things existing at the same time. First of all, it's important to recognize that identity politics is actually not a bad word, but it's been turned into a bad word. So we should think about that as similar to critical race theory or DEI more generally. But also what we're watching is the backlash to the success of people recognizing that their identity matters. And so to have people feel silenced around their identity was a backlash. The more progress that we've made with DEI initiatives, the more people have recognized, oh, there's a power differential here and I can use my privilege to help other people. That tendency is what the backlash has been about. And so what we're watching is good and decent regular people push back against the backlash. And that's why I'm so excited about it. We're all owning our identity and using it in coalition. Yeah, when we come forward, you take an ED is here, uh, Dr. Caritha Mitchell. We're talking about these Zoom calls, these Zoom calls that are literally bringing together hundreds of thousands of people. Now, uh, Jateka says Zoom has responded and that you will literally be able to get a million people on a call uh, to organize for a political campaign. How do you keep this momentum going, uh, particularly given how divided we are as a country? Uh, Jateka probably since you have not personally, it was sent on her behalf, an invitation to join her and hundreds of thousands of women who've been meeting on calls when with Black women. I know on July 21st, I was actually in New York when I got the news that Biden was stepping down. I was doing a bunch of interviews and started getting bombarded with emails from friends all over the country, all different you know, ages, socioeconomic classes, all different folks, family members included, uh, telling me about the call, Joteka, and what was happening that night. And, and I was one of the folks who joined the call as well. How do you keep this momentum going? There's so much excitement around the Harris uh, Walls campaign. Obviously, all these calls that we've been talking about are evidence of that momentum. But how, uh, how do you keep it going? We got, I don't know, 60 plus days before uh, this election. Uh, is there any sense that there is Zoom fatigue setting in with respect to any of these calls? Well, we keep getting new Zooms every day. And I think that it's important to know I'm an organizer. I've been organizing a strategist for more than 20 years. And certainly we will continue to have Zoom meetings, but we are not going to Zoom our way into a victory <laughs> on election day <laughs> certainly the work is the work is in communities across this country and and that zoom will certainly help us gather inspire inform us and 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 give us motivation but we have to turn that into work that has to be turned into movements on the ground in communities and that's certainly what we're doing we are organizing voter registration and, and we're seeing a result of that we we see that voter registration amongst black women young black women is up 175 percent that is historic levels we're seeing uh, a level of enthusiasm and, and right before you left i think what was so important the conversation that you and karitha was having that it is so important like this idea of identity is like to lean into who we are and then one of the things that i'm so grateful to to my mother uh to the black women in my life to my mentors who always told me to be unapologetically a black woman be your brilliant beautiful self um and and to be and lean into being a black woman doesn't mean that i that i am any less smart any less great of a strategist any less um, dynamic as an individual, it, it just simply means that I lean into the thing that makes me uniquely who I am. And I am a black woman. I am a black woman that grew up on a dirt road in South Carolina. Um, and no one would ever take that from me. And in many ways, that actually helps make me 
um, a unique contributor to any table that I am, whether it's been the corporate uh, boardrooms that I have sat in or whether or not it's been at political tables of which I sat. And I think that goes for Black women across the board. I was having a conversation, ironically, last night with uh, Ross, who organized white dudes for Kamala. <laughs> and Ross and I were having a conversation and we were just talking about you know, our, 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 our mutual respect for each other's work. And, and, and what he and I both agreed is that, you know, in this moment, particularly this notion of identity politics and, um, you know, professor, I studied political science. So, uh, you know, I, I understand, like, you know, we all understand, like, how they try to divide us and like identity politics would be painted as this bad thing. Um, but in this moment, you know, you look at the frame, oh, that we are segregated and that we're organizing uh, in a segregated manner. I have never felt uh, more close to white men or um, a Swifty than I have in, in ever. I, I never thought that I would have anything in common with the Swifty. Okay, I gotta ask you, do we have bracelets with women with black women? We do not have bracelets. <laughs> we do have t-shirts at a full merch store. You can go to our merch store uh, or our website uh, to find it. But the, the thing that I will say is that Irene Kim and, and the Swifties for Kamala, what we do have in common, we have in common our, our agreement around the future of this country. Uh, we certainly um, have in common uh, what we want to see as it relates to our women being able to have the freedom to choose uh, what to do with our bodies in this country. And, and we're all united around our desire to see Kamala Harris as the 47th president of this country. And it's the same when you think about the adventurers or, or these other entities that are coming together. We are united around our vision for this country. And I think that's so beautiful. And I see the professor, I'm, I am not trying to take your, 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 uh, your role, uh, uh, Ariva, but I see the professor trying to get in there. No, no, no. And, and I want to ask this question though. So Joteka, you mentioned the Swifties, you mentioned some of the other groups of white dudes. You didn't mention white women. Was that purposeful? Do you no. feel that same kinship with white women? as you feel with the Swifties and some of these other groups? Absolutely, I do. Okay. And, and I just wanted to make sure that wasn't an intentional. Oh, no. no, it was not intentional at all. And Shannon Watts and I actually spent a lot of time talking to each other. I pick up the phone, I, I talk to her on a regular basis. And we're all about to do something very special together very soon. We'll be making an announcement around something coming up very soon uh, that we're super excited to be doing together. together. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, jump in, Dr. Mitchell. I know you have some thoughts about this, you know, kind of identity politics or what people generally, again, paint as negative as being something positive. Yes. And I so appreciate the way that Joteka just wove all of those different groups together, because the reason that, that I wrote the piece, Why Identity-Based Zooms Matter for Time Magazine, is precisely because part of what I believe ordinary white Americans in this country, what they did not take as the lesson from Joe Biden that they should have is that when you are a good, decent white person, you have been taught that you are good and decent simply because you aren't the one hurling slurs. So when, 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 when Trump, um, becomes politically relevant by questioning Barack Obama's credentials with birtherism, good, decent white people didn't stand up and say, this isn't our way. When Trump made fun of the reporter with disabilities, we didn't see good and decent white people mobilize as good and decent white people and say, this does not represent us. When he launched his campaign talking about Mexicans or rapists, you didn't see good, decent white people mobilize. And what I believed Joe Biden was doing is he was saying, I'm ordinary Joe, ain't nothing special about me, but I'm going to mobilize to get the country back to a sense of decency. And so what we have watched is white people get that lesson finally when Joe Biden was pressured to step aside he recognized that, hey, we had a primary where we had every demographic you can think of represented and his flaws as a cisgender straight white man, his flaws were on display, but his flaws never became disqualifying. But any flaw for Kamala Harris became disqualifying. Who else was in that? Julian Castro, Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, you name every category and they were there, but their flaws became disqualifying. So what you have watched is Joe Biden recognize that he has a power within his identity as a cisgender straight white man, and I can make 
the call that I am putting all of my endorsement behind Kamala Harris. We watched him do that. And I want us to recognize that as decent white men that made the path for another decent white man in Tim Walls. So I feel like part of what we're watching, when we saw Shannon Watts pick up the torch from Joe, Joteka Edie and say, we have fallen on the job before as white women. We have fallen on that job, but we're gonna actually take your leadership, black women, this time. All of this to my mind, Ariva, is we are watching Good, decent white people realize that white villainy is not going to take a break. And you can't just be on the sidelines saying, I didn't hurl the racial slur. You got to be in the fight for decency. You know, it's not so interesting you say that. I'm, I'm working on a case, uh, Reparations Matter in Palm Springs, California. And uh, we had an activation and a young white Episcopalian priest said exactly what you're saying. He said, it's not enough for uh, us to be here in this moment supporting these black and brown families who are fighting uh, for restitution and fighting for their humanity. You know, I really want to talk about those good white people who were in Palm Springs in the 1950s and 60s who stood around, who didn't consider themselves racist, but they didn't stand up mm -hmm. uh, for those folks in that community that didn't have a voice. So I, I think you're absolutely right in this moment. Joe Biden gave white folks permission to do what he did, which was to stand up and say, you know, this is not who we are as Americans. Uh, and that message is being heard loud and, and clear. When we come forward, I want to talk about Stacey Abrams and similarities with uh, Joe Taka and the work that you're doing. I was having a conversation with Jasmine uh, Crockett, Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett from uh, Texas, and she wants Texas to become purple, blue, and follow uh, what Stacey Abrams did in terms of, of how she Stacey Abrams is credited uh, for you know the wins that we've seen in Georgia for Joe Biden for those two Democratic senators. What to see if it is this Zoom organizing strategy, Joe Taker, that you're using? Can it be a strategy that gets some of states like Texas, like Florida? back over in the dim column. So Joe Taker was having a call uh, conversation this weekend. Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett was in Los Angeles for an event for the DNC and I was at that event chatting with her and she's really, really interested in uh, the work that Stacey Abrams did in Georgia and how she can replicate some of that work in the state of Texas. We see all the crazy politics coming out of Texas from the governor to the uh, attorney general of that state. We see Florida, which gave us Val Demings uh, as a congresswoman, but uh, even uh, former congresswoman Val Demings said that Florida lost like 500,000 Democratic voters, which made it impossible for her to win when she ran for Senate in that state. So do you see the work you're doing now as having the potential of turning some of these red states uh, blue or at least purple? I think it, first of all, two, two women that I love and admire. I've known Stacey Abrams for over 15 years. We've been in the trenches organizing together and so very much understand the model and the work that, that Stacey has done so beautifully. And uh, Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, someone else who I, uh, also a, a soror of mine, who was on, the first, on that Zoom call on July 21st. She was right there with us. And I, I think that what we have seen is the, the level of energy that is around the country is that the political map is, is opening up in different ways. And I think what people are understanding is the power of people. I mean, you know, if you think about 44,000 Black women and our friends and allies on a Zoom and another 50,000 outside, but all gathered, you know, nearly 100,000 people. And you think about that energy of you probably could separate everybody out into their states. And what that meant if all of those people voted. And so many elections are won by such a slim margin of error. And I think that what it's going to take to redefine all of our political maps is first, just doing away with writing off a state just because it has been traditionally red or blue. And I think we have to invest in a 50 state strategy. And, and, I, and, I, and I love the leadership of Jamie Harrison, another good friend at the DNC, that is investing while certainly you have to concentrate in certain states, but investing in all states because it takes time. I, I think also it's going to be important to make sure that we are constantly expanding the electorate. 
We have to saturate voter registration. It's it's wonderful to see Black women voter registration up 175% and voter registration rates across the board up. But we have to do that in place after place after place after place. Um, and then also making sure that we are protecting the ballot box. Uh, the reality is that in Texas, just recently it was announced that, you know, they've purged thousands of people off the rolls. And so a lot of people will vote. And unfortunately, Election Day is not a holiday in this country. It should be a holiday. But people will go to vote. And sometimes they only have an hour because they don't get mm -hmm. the day off to vote. And you are standing in lines that are seven and eight hours long, which is done on purpose um, to uh, limit the resources of people's availability and the resources to vote. And it becomes a clunky process uh, with the express goal of people not being able to cast that ballot. And then when you get there, you find out that you've been purged off the rolls because maybe you hadn't voted in the last four years. And now you're excited. And then they tell you have to file a provisional ballot. And so making sure that Congress will pass, you know, the John uh, Lewis Voting Rights Act um, that will fix um the broken um, voting rights uh, laws that we now have as a result of Shelby County versus Holder, which was a Supreme Court case that invalidated sections of the voting rights, um, the voting rights uh, uh, law in uh, the voting right, federal voting rights law, but then also the Freedom to Vote Act, which would actually put into place the ability for those to expand uh, voting to make voting more easy. That's what it's going to take. And then also, it's just going to take really continuing to talk to people for them to understand the power of their vote. I think when I look at the excitement of 30 and 40,000 people showing up to a Harris Walls event and just being excited, like turning those into votes will monumentally change uh, the landscape and not just the top of the ticket. And I think that's also very important. Who is at your local level is going to matter, sometimes more so than who's at the top of the ticket is certainly important. But who's the school board on your school board is going to affect the day to day lives of your children? Who is the district attorney is going to affect justice in your country? Because when we look at the case of Ahmaud Arbery, we are all outraged by the fact that this man was murdered in his own neighborhood, just running and jogging, yep. but there was no justice in the case. But then when you look at like that county and you look at that district attorney who was elected into office, who had been elected into office and that seat had been held by a Republican for nearly 20 years, uncontested. And it was in a place where black folks and people of color made up nearly 40% of the electorate. And so you begin to ask yourself, well, what if people voted in mass numbers um, and showed our power Then we could elect people in the office that could actually enact change that affects our lives and also was in alignment with our values? So I do think that we could change the political map. I think it's possible. And I think if anybody could do it, uh, Jasmine Crockett could certainly do it in, in Texas. And I think there are. Um, you know, there are 50 Jasmine Crockett's across the country um, and multiples of those that are actually mm -hmm. doing work every day on the ground um, to do uh, the type of strategy that that Stacy put into place to turn Georgia purple and blue. Yeah. And what do you think, Dr. Mitchell, kind of going forward? You're a historian of sorts, you're a political scientist. Uh, you have noted the this movement and you've made the comparison to Black women's uh, clubs in the late 1800s, the early 1900s. If, if you had a crystal ball and could look, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, do you think this way of organizing, whether it's Zoom or, or some other platform, but people coming together in the comfort of their own homes, not having to show up at a community center or not having to show up uh, at a church or some other gathering place, uh, do you see this becoming the norm, the standard? So anyone who launches a campaign is going to want a group similar to win with black women behind them to galvanize voters in their we perspective. Do. And history. I would say that. And I would say that part of what's powerful about what we're seeing, even in the immediacy of this moment, is the fact that it's very clear that Kamala Harris is 
working not only to win, but also to govern, right? So investing, as you said, at the top of the hour, investing at that at those lower um, race levels to make sure that people are supporting so that she can have the Congress that she needs to make that progress. So for my money, these Zooms that are wrapped around identity are a way for more and more Americans to actually see themselves as political actors. And that's what I see as the parallel between the 1890s and the early 1930s is that we have gotten away from seeing ourselves as political actors. We have gotten away from understanding the power of our vote and most importantly, the power of our community conversations. And what the Zooms are doing is reinvigorating the fact that when we're in community conversation, we can have the conversation we need to figure out what's my little piece that I can do. And if we all are doing that piece, then we can make a difference. The other reason why I am so excited by this moment moment as relates to my research is that to your point, being in private spaces like Zoom or at your home is exactly what I was studying in Living with Lynching, watching Black women create a safe space for these important conversations that activated them in the public sphere. So it's a reminder that I am worthy of having more political rights. I've got to gather myself privately before I turn out publicly so I can have that strength. And that's what we're watching. Yeah, it's pretty amazing uh, th that privacy point, I think, gets lost on a lot of people, but a lot of people aren't comfortable uh, volunteering for campaigns. They maybe feel like they don't have the time. Maybe they feel like there's nothing to offer. I know I got the email you're taking from a lot of folks who I know are not politically active normally, uh, but they were inspired uh, to have even been invited and they felt like you know this was an opportunity for them to join something that was bigger than them and that they could participate kind of at their own level uh, at their own pace and it you know wasn't going to be high pressure they could be anonymous in many ways obviously 40,000 90,000 people uh, one person isn't going to draw a, a ton of attention so it really did create an opportunity for I think women and now we know men and all kinds of people together in a safe space to do something that obviously is transformative thank you so so much, uh, Jataka, for your leadership. Thank you for organizing in the way that you have been doing, not just on July 21st, but as you said, for the last, uh, I'll say 20 years of your life, because whatever those other jobs were, they were clearly preparing you for this moment. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Mitchell, for your insightful article. Really appreciate your insights as well.